Well, good evening, everybody. Hello. Uh, my name is Dave Petley. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor for Research and Enterprise here uh, at UEA. And I would like to welcome you very warmly um, to this inaugural lecture. Um, actually, it's one of the greatest pleasures of, of the role that I have here as, as sort of strategic lead of research is, is to introduce inaugural lectures, which are just a great celebration of the, of the work that's led some of our best professors to become professors um, and to hear about um, what makes them tick. I would also like to welcome those of us who are joining um, uh, the inaugural lecture tonight online. Uh, it's great to have you listening. Um, and uh, based on previous experience, there's always quite a number of those. Um, so let me uh, introduce you uh, to Professor Nicholas Bolding, who's going to give tonight's inaugural lecture. She is based at UEA's School of Health Sciences. So Nicola went straight into her career as an occupational therapist, uh, successfully completing her education at St Andrew's School of Occupational Therapy uh, in 1986. Her first post was at the then West Norwich Hospital, uh, now Norwich Community Hospital, working on a care of the elderly medical ward and a surgical ward. After nine months, she was contacted uh, to ask if she would apply for a position at the James Paget Hospital in Great Yarmouth. She worked there for nine years, specially, specialising in orthopaedics and palliative care. During this time, she developed a very successful preoperative education program for patients awaiting a total hip replacement, believed to be one of the first, or maybe even the first, in the country. As well as working full-time, she also undertook a degree at City College in care and education in the community, and during this time, she began to research the benefits of preoperative patient education. In January 1995, uh, Nicola became a, a lecturer in occupational therapy here at UEA in the then School of Occupational Therapy and Physiotherapy, moving to senior lecturer and then professor in 2013. During her time at UEA, she has continued her education with an MA and then a doctorate in education. During these studies, she undertook various projects to enhance her skills as an educator and a researcher. Her main research interests are around patient education, in which she has many publications and has given multiple conference presentations. She's undertaken various leadership roles here at UEA, including admissions officer, course director of both the BSc and the MSc programs in occupational therapy, school teaching director, associate dean for teaching and learning, and deputy head of school, which leads me to conclude that you must have been extremely busy. As you'll have noticed, Nicola's CV combines extensive experience as a practitioner, an educator, and a researcher, as well as an academic leader, giving her a unique insight and a diverse skill set, uh, which makes her a great asset to her school and to the university here at UEA. Her presentation tonight will focus on her career as an occupational therapist, and as a lecturer, and the successful interplay between education and practice in her career. So, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Professor Nicholas Bolding to give her professorial inaugural lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pro Vice Chancellor. Thank you all for, for coming along on this dark February evening. And I understand I'm competing with Carrow Road tonight. There's a football match. So um, some colleagues are going to be live streaming or um, catching up on that later. The purpose of an inaugural lecture is to celebrate and share academic achievements and thank people who have helped. And I intend to do that. Um, I want to sort of share my career journey the things that have been important to me, particularly obviously occupational therapy, but also how um, education has been brought into my career um, quite significantly. And I want to think about how occupational therapy, uh, occupational therapy and education can support people, but actually how it's done exactly that for me as well. Um, it's quite interesting when you're standing here, and I think this is what they mean by your worlds collide, when you've got um, your colleagues here, um, welcome the new dean of our faculty, particularly our acting head of school, um, dear colleagues, but also you've got your friends and your family as well, so it, uh, it's a great mix, and uh, so I hope you all enjoy it. 
So, as I said, I want to share my career in occupational therapy, but um, fairly early in the career, I started to really explore education. In the first instance, it was around patient education, um, but then later on coming into the, um, the University of East Anglia. But it's all within the context of kind of, if you want to call it fate or perhaps serendipitous events, things that actually shaped my career, um, often a lot of them unplanned. And I want to um, look at that particularly as we go through um, that, my career. So what was I thinking about early on in terms of a career? Well, you could argue in this one that I was thinking about teaching. Here I am looking on some young pupil there um, with my book already. So it might have given a few, few clues. I strayed a bit here, it might kind of look like I'm the blonde one, by the way, where's my sister? <laughs> yeah, um, that I was sort of thinking about veterinary practice. You could argue that I was uh, exploring the world of monkey business to go into the NHS and to uh, uh, education. And um, here I am with my two cousins, one of them here um, tonight. So I was thinking about nursing. So perhaps there was some clues that I was going to end up in healthcare and education, who knows? So just want to um, mention sort of a bit, bit about my background. This is Lowestoft. I was born and bred, um, so not very far away from here. And I went to Kirkley High School, um, now infamous for the wrong reasons. But for me, it was a great place to do my O-levels. That ages me, and my A-levels. And I did all the normal things like ballet and girl guides and reading and learning. Um, it was a great supportive family that I have, and I was encouraged greatly but not pushed. Um, Parents were always proud of everything that I did. There was one exception, though, that um, I started to learn to play the recorder. And um, I don't think I was very good because my mother begged me not to learn the violin. And um, so I didn't kind of go too far with that. But I did actually, after recorder lessons, start to learn to play the guitar. I was probably about seven or eight. Um, and I think I really did impress somebody there. Um, and I'll tell you more about that later. So I worked hard at school, um, sorry, family there, worked very hard at school. I was never confident, but I was in a very supportive environment with um, teachers that really encouraged me to grow and explore and do new, new things, and they had confidence in me, and my, my family had confidence in me. So the observant amongst you will know that this is not Norfolk. Um, this is perhaps um, one of those significant events that really does change your life. So um, this is the Isle of Rum. Some of you might recognise it from Spring Watch, Autumn Watch, um, and the castle down on the bottom there, um, Restoration. But I went here in 1981, so I'd just finished my O-levels. Um, went there on a school trip to do some conservation work and um, walking. Um, a fantastic holiday. Unfortunately, we weren't staying in the castle. It was a school trip, so we were on the bothy there, um, sort of camping on the floor. But um, there was somebody there that was doing his Duke of Edinburgh, and um, I recognised him from the guitar lessons that I'd had when I was seven or eight. Anyway, we started um, dating after that. So a big, significant holiday. Going into the sixth form, I wasn't really sure what career I wanted to do, and um, thank you to uh, Mrs. Goward, an inspirational teacher. She's in the middle there. Um, my family held a party in the garden for friends, and we invited her along to say thank you. But she... Um, asked me what I wanted to do as a career, and I wasn't sure. I'd briefly looked at the army. That would have been a complete disaster. <laughs> my, my family and friends are laughing because I was a tad homesick when I went away to college. It was only two and a half out of the three years, but um, it, it just wouldn't have worked. Well, in fact, father said I couldn't go in the army. I had to be the Navy or the Air Force, but I wasn't, uh, you know, that really wasn't going to be me. So um, I said the things that I wanted to do, the things that I was very much interested in, and um, Mrs. Garrett had this sort of magic box and she sort of filtered through it and she said, oh, have you thought about occupational therapy? Never heard of it before. So, of course, I did a lot of um, exploring about it, the College of Occupational Therapists, but also did some voluntary work. And, um, well, the rest is history, isn't it? So I'm deeply indebted to her. So I went to St Andrews, Andrews School of Occupational Therapy, um, successful after doing my A-levels. Here it is. Um, looks a little bit different. This is a, a new picture the, on the bottom there. There's an lecture theatre attached there, but that's the cohort um, that I was with. Some of them are, are here today. So it was a, a great opportunity. It was a very good grounding in occupational therapy. Um, occupational therapy then was a diploma. It wasn't a, a degree programme. Um, and it was all sort of central to the College of Occupational Therapists, but there was these individual schools, and we're in the grounds of this big psychiatric, big private psychiatric hospital, um, and there was sort of 50 or so in the cohort, and, and there we sat. 
Okay, so um, shared a house during that time um, with three other girls. They're all here um, tonight. So Helen there with me outside, so Wantage Road. And here I am in my uniform. This is at Adam Brooks Hospital. Um, our uniform, I often used to get mistaken for a bus driver, for a road sweeper, so it wasn't the most glamorous of uniforms, but um, hey-ho, you just have to go with it. I chose all of my placements in East Anglia because that was where the train and the bus could get me home. Um, so, but I had great experience. I went to Peterborough and did care of the elderly, um, Newmarket, surgical and elderly, King's Lynn, mental health, um, Adam Brooks, as I said, here in the uniform, acute neurology and rehabilitation, all fantastic places. I managed to get one in Norwich, um, but um, I still was, uh, was sort of here during the week and then going home at weekends. Northampton was a challenge, going home at weekends, but I did it. Five and a half hours on the coach on a Friday night and five and a half hours on a Sunday. Um, boyfriend of the time would uh, shove me onto the coach to get me back again. So I didn't really want to go. So I was a bit of a pain to the three girls I lived with. Here they are. So this is on our graduation day in 1986. Um, <laughs> they're laughing. Well, if I'm going to be out here, you can at least uh, experience it. That and so here we are. Yes, we graduated um, from the school. And I've the, the second one, um, Julie, a great friend, who's also here tonight with her family. So we've stayed in touch. You make the best of friends when you go to college. Um, you kind of experience everything when you're living um, together. We holiday together occasionally. Um, we phone each other up uh, sort of at least a couple of times a month. Absolutely fantastic friends. And fantastic careers. Um, of the, the five of us, really, that are here. Obviously, there's me in education, but Ailsa runs her own business, a very successful business in independent practice, and she employs a number of staff. Um, aids and adaptations in the, the shop that she has, but she also has contracts with scooter and wheelchair companies, electric wheelchairs. <coughs> Helen works for a housing association. She's, she's working to um, enable people to stay at home, doing major adaptations with architects, as well as the minor adaptation. Sue is a case manager. Um, for a private company not too far away from here, but employs, it's run by an OT and employs lots and lots of occupational therapists working as case managers in medical legal work, um, but also acquired brain injury. Julie, she works for a charity in rehabilitation again, working with people that have got acquired um, brain injury. So fantastic careers, and that's what's so wonderful about occupational therapy. There's a lot of students here, I think, tonight as graduates here, and it's, it's great that, that you are all here. Thank you. You have entered the most sort of wonderful career ever. Um, it doesn't have to be in the NHS, but it can be too, but it just shows you where we've all gone and, and done our own things. So, um, qualified... Um, I can remember saying to somebody I felt like I wanted an L plate on my back when I started walking around the wards because um, suddenly you are very responsible. So the first job was at what was then the West Norwich Hospital and um, I was living back home at the time and was catching the train and then cycling to the West Norwich and I was working with people, elderly clients, medical um, and surgical rehabilitation. But I wasn't there very long um, when the train got cancelled. Um, there's a surprise, but it was very snowy and the train didn't work for the full week. So I said, well, OK, lots of hospital, I'm only down the road. Would you like me to come in and do some work for you? So that's what I did. And um, as a result of that, another kind of serendipitous event was that the James Paget, who were kind of part of Lowest Hospital, said, well, would you apply for a job? Would you come and work for, for us? Um, and it would be orthopaedics and we can do a rotation for you. So um, I finished my time at, at West Norwich and then went on to the, the James Paget. But that first job was really good in helping you to sort of see what the, the kind of key work was as an occupational therapist. Again, it was people that were elderly, had had an acute episode, um, who had surgery, and your job was really to help them to go back home again. So doing a lot um, to support that discharge home, um, dressing assessments, kitchen assessments. So getting, uh, asking patients to make themselves a, a hot drink. I never told them that I didn't drink hot drinks, so I probably wasn't the best one to be assessing them, but um, they carried on. Regardless, thankfully, and doing home visits, but supporting patients to go home again and working with patients that had had surgical amputation and um, introducing to the, the concept of having a wheelchair, assessing them for a wheelchair before they went off somewhere else to do their rehabilitation. So I said I went off to the James Paget, <coughs> excuse me, after just a little time and was there for nine years. I was very worried at the time that it would look like having only been somewhere for eight months. Um, was I going to stick at anything? But um, I did. 
Um, so just in 1987 was a significant year. I've just moved to the James Paget and I got married. Um, this is the guy from the guitar lessons <laughs> and, uh, and also that Duke of Edinburgh trip. And this time we did stay in Kinloch Castle when we went back for our honeymoon. Uh, a fantastic place. Okay, so occupational therapy at the James Paget is a, a great place to work. There weren't many occupational therapists then, and we were encouraged to, to kind of explore and do um, things that we sort of felt were, were necessary, um, important things, but to develop as well, really encouraged to develop. And so a lot of my work was, again, the dressing practices. I was working with people that had hip replacements, um, knee replacements, or had fractures, a fracture neck of femur. And after that type of surgery, then, this is the 80s, um, there was a restricted movement post-surgery, so you can't um, bend your hip more than 90 degrees, you can't rotate your hip, and you can't cross your legs. So it means things like getting on socks, tights, pants, trousers, um, is very difficult. You can't reach past your knees. Um, and so my job was really to facilitate. They couldn't stay in the hospital for the 12 weeks that they had these restrictions on, and my job was to help them to go home, because... Toilets were generally too low, chairs and beds were too low, um, it might be difficult getting on and off toilets, etc. So fitting equipment in home, I would be sort of famous for driving around Norfolk and Suffolk and in the back of the car was generally a commode, raised toilet seats and chair blocks, bed blocks. Um, might have the patient next to me and I got my assistant in the back. It was all a bit of a squash um, in the little mini metro that they gave me to drive around in, but we somehow managed it. So a, a great time, but also we, because it was a small um, department, we on a Tuesday and Thursday afternoons, we also used to do outpatients, so I could develop my skills in terms of outpatients and making splints for patients, doing hand classes. We had a fantastic heavy workshop um, and a garden area and a greenhouse. Um, I did get into trouble once when the nurses were getting soil in the patient's bed. He was a, a little market gardener and he was on traction for 12 weeks and poor chap was really um, quite bored and fed up. So he used to come down, and because he knew what he was doing, and we didn't when we were with these seedlings and things, he used to come down and tell us what we needed to be doing with, with the garden, but it was great therapy and uh, worked particularly for him. And I also worked with the Macmillan nurses. They asked me if I would to, um, support patients that were then in the final stages of their life but wanted to go home. Um, so helping them to get the hospital bed in, the commode and the support, um, and we might only have sort of, I don't know, a couple of days or, or less really to get somebody home. So um, it was a great mix and great opportunity that I had there. While I was there, um, a consultant, orthopaedic consultant, asked me if I would help him with his orthopaedic waiting list. So again, this is the late 80s, and people were on a waiting list to have a total hip replacement for two years or more, and that's pretty tough when you can't reach down past your knees, when you, when you sit down, when you stand up, when you wake up in the morning and you're in pain. So it's really hard. They knew that they were going to be waiting a long time, but he had this idea and asked me to help him develop an assessment so that it was more needs-based rather than first come, first serve. So we designed this assessment form. To, that was very occupational focused. It was great in that I could ask the patients questions about their lifestyle and the things that they could and couldn't do, whether they could get to the shops or not, whether they needed help to get their tights or socks on. Um, and they would get a score, and then this score would determine where they were on the list. So the higher score in patients would be moved right up the list, the lower score um, at the bottom. It was a clinic I did on a Friday afternoons with an assistant, and it was quite harrowing because all of these patients, you kind of wanted them to have their surgery the very next day if you could. But also what I started to do was to offer them a home visit to at least be able to go out and um, get some equipment in for them to help. But I, I also wanted to look at um, rationing, really, because that's essentially what we were doing at that time, and um, looked at the law, really, and saw, see what that said um, in regards to rationing, and also the ethics of having a, a waiting list. Um, and then also published in terms of looking at promoting the occupational therapist role that we could have in helping people to manage their surgical waiting list um, and support patients because that was key for me. So it's quite a unique role um, and we would, would reassess the patients every six months so they'd come back if they hadn't had their surgery um, and then we would um, do another assessment and might move them up on the list. Then from that, it 
always surprised me, shouldn't have been really, but it surprised me when patients would come in to have their hip replacement, they were totally unaware of the things that were going to be happening to them, that we were going to be saying, well, you can't reach your knee, so you won't be able to reach down to the bottom shelf of your fridge, you won't be able to reach into the bottom of your oven, your chair is probably going to be too low, your um, bed's too low, you're going to need to borrow this raised toilet seat. So they hadn't really got much of an idea um, about what was happening. And remember, this is pre-Google. Um, you know, the under-25s in the audience probably can't imagine that. But it wasn't easy. And I think in the medical service, we were very protective and weren't giving out that much information. And of course, you know, some patients will have spoken to their great-aunt's neighbour's next-door neighbour's friend about having a hip replacement, but um, that might not have been particularly accurate um, an account. So I decided, I spoke to pre-operative education department and said, can we not do something? Can we set up some sort of education program for patients so that they can come in and, and learn about um, what's going to be happening to them? It's a complete surprise and I don't think it should be. So we set up a program, initially started off as a nine-week course, um, just an hour a week. We would get the same patients in, about 20 patients and their relatives, the carer, usually a spouse, would be invited to come along with them. And I put a timetable together and you've got it here. So first of all, I would do an introduction and um, they would, so they'd be invited with a letter, but they would come along, um, uh, say about 20 patients and carers. And to sort of talk to them about, please ask us any questions that you like. If you don't want to sort of feel that you can ask a question out loud, then speak to us later on um, and we can answer the, the questions for you. We used to get um, an anaesthetist or pain control sister to come down and talk to the patients and tell them uh, um, about the pain control and how they would be able to control their old analgesia when they came round from surgery. They loved it when the anaesthetist used to come. He used to come gowned up. He was quite a character um, and he would play on that. But they loved it. They felt valued that somebody so important um, would come and talk to them. Um, I clearly wasn't that important, but anyway... <laughs> Um, healthy diet, so the dietitian would come along and talk to them about you know, healthy eating, there's so many myths and it's hard to understand the media, it was no different then, but also how a healthy diet would support them in their recovery post-operatively. The nurse would talk about admission onto the ward and what it would be like, what would happen on the day that they came into hospital, um, the morning before um, surgery, etc. But also the things that they could bring in and they could look at a menu sheet and decide, sort of look at, you know, the choices that they'd have. So they've got an understanding of what it's going to be like. The two weeks of their life is going to be on this ward. The physiotherapist would talk about exercise and mobility pre-operatively but also post-operatively saying that on day one you are going to be getting out of bed and we'll be with you but you need to start your exercises and therefore you need to take your pain um, control your pain analgesia um, as soon as possible so that there was no kind of ideas that uh, people were quite shocked that we were going to be getting them up on on day one and then I would do a session on joint protection life at home, really helping them to think about how they could prepare at home if they lived on their own, um, particularly filling up the freezer, who could they get for help, um, who could do their shopping again. You know, the waitress weren't going to be around the corner with their van. Um, that just wasn't like that then. And I also invited a patient that had had a hip replacement to come along because that credibility is far greater. I hadn't had that lived experience far greater that they listened to somebody that had been through the experience. She was a, a wonderful character, was very happy to show this great big scar, but she talked positively about it because it's quite negative. You can't do this and you mustn't do that and you won't be doing this. So to actually have a patient come through the other, the other end of it um, was very successful. So that was our, our education classes. It hit the headlines. Um, I was interviewed by uh, BBC Look East and uh, the local papers and things. And um, we were, it, it was a, a great opportunity to sell it, really. And, and from that, a lot of occupational therapists in the area in East Anglia got in touch and said, well, um, you know, can you come and talk to us? We'd like to do something similar as well. Um, <laughs> it was interesting. We, we knew we were going to be interviewed, so my assistant said, well, I'm going to have to have my hair done. So I said, well, OK, if you want to have your hair done. They were filming the class as well. It, as I say, it went out on Look East, and poor girl, they had her demonstrating using a sock aid, but they had everything sort of from the waist down, so her, her new hairdo was uh, wasted, unfortunately. I missed learning. I'd been working for two or three years, and I absolutely missed it. Now, I left college thinking I was never going to be going back to do any learning at all. It wasn't in my life's plan. Um, I don't even remember how I saw this course advertised at City College, but um, I was lucky in that the James Paget funded it for me. So it was a four-year part-time degree, Wednesday afternoons and evenings. So I still worked full-time um, at the Paget. 
But here really was where health and education and research came together for me. And don't, it was just missing learning. I'd got no game plan. I'm not somebody that has a um, five-year career plan. Um, but it, was, it worked particularly for me. I enjoyed how you could look at the evidence base for what you were doing. I enjoyed learning with a group of other healthcare professionals, but also teachers, um, social workers, lots of different people, and thinking about sort of how the health and the research could come together. Um, that was very significant. So I was encouraged to, obviously you have to do assignments, but I was encouraged to look at my workplace and how I could use assignments to really fit with my particular career and things I wanted to find out. It's a, a, you know, doing education is a great opportunity to look at things that you want to find out more about. That's the beauty of it. Um, and one of the first assignments was looking at health promotion and the role of occupational therapy. So could go back and think about that key role that we have as occupational therapists. We have got a fantastic opportunity to do health promotion. Now it is part of our role. You know, every minute counts when you're working with patients. Um, you were encouraged to look at their healthy lifestyle and encourage them in that way. Um, but it was fairly new then, and um, so I wanted to explore that a lot more. And really promoting the work that we could do. I, um, in the James Paget, we had cardiac rehabilitation groups, we had falls groups, um, joint protection groups, back care and back pain. So in this, I was sort of bringing it all together and really looking at the evidence base for it. Then I also wanted to look at pre-operative education. I wanted to know, was it the right thing to be doing? It's costly. And um, I was very aware of that. I wasn't able to run the classes as regularly as I liked because of all the other work that I was doing. Um, but I wanted to know, I, f I kind of had that feeling that it was the right thing to do. The patients were very much saying to me, you know, this has been great, we really appreciate it, but I needed some evidence base. So um, one of the, the assignments was to look at what is the evidence base and actually to, act to define it. So my definition is the process of informing patients about their condition, the surgery and post-operative care, and the instruction on adherence to a treatment regime. And some of the things the patient said to me, said it was reassuring. They, it was reassuring to know that they weren't alone. They were meeting others in the same situation. That was particularly important. So aside from anything that I was doing or saying to them, I was bringing some patients together. Um, and there was, over the nine-week programme, there was quite a bonding going on. And husbands whose wives were going into hospital were sharing recipes so that they wouldn't starve while their wives were in hospital um, and would bring in samples of sausage rolls or whatever it was that they'd cooked that week. Very proud of themselves. So there was that, that bonding that was particularly important. <coughs> Patients said it helped to know what to expect. Um, so clear evidence that although... I said the health service, I think, was quite protective um, for patients, rightly or wrongly, patients are saying they wanted to know more. And it isn't easy to find out about, um, or it wasn't easy to find out about surgery then. A key thing, it sort of gives you confidence. To me, that was particularly important. Um, they'd got confidence in coming in to have surgery. You know, their life was going to be in our hands, so in lots of different ways, but also confident that they were going to be able to return home and manage and be okay. And the last one here, it helped me prepare. I got a high chair and the aids that were demonstrated at the programme I immediately bought so I could practice before the operation. So they are wanting to prepare. They're wanting to take back some control. They lost a lot of control. The pain has prevented them from doing things. They've not been able to go out. They've had to rely on others. This is a chance to actually take back some of that control. You know, they, patients talked about, my body has let me down. Um, a quote which I still use with, with some of the students and some learning that I do. They felt um, that, that you know, there wasn't anything they could do about it and they were waiting for a couple of years at least to have surgery. But they could take some of that control back and do something about it. I want to share with you this poem that a patient wrote to me after she had been on one of the education programmes. What a sad day our course is through. It's time to say goodbye to you. It would be so nice to meet again, all walking well and free from pain. Nicola and Clara, we thank sincerely for arranging it all and behaving so cheerily. We've enjoyed the drinks, oh that dreadful machine, still it enlivened our Wednesday scene. Thanks to all speakers most pleasant to meet, dietitian and terrorists and the man about feet. I'll explain. <coughs> Dr Cooper reassured us and said we would sleep without the need to count any sheep. Thanks again to everyone for a serious course which gave us some fun. Best wishes to all till the day we can say it's my turn now. Hip, hip, hooray. Isn't that wonderful?
Um, I better explain Clara, she was my assistant, at that, it's a pseudonym um, there. Um, that dreadful machine, we had this drinks machine, and um, it was the tech, I'm not good at technology. Um, husband's nodding there, not even a drinks machine. And um, it used to sort of, this sort of lump of coffee and then the hot water and it wouldn't dissolve and there would just be this great lump of coffee. So um, we ended up all drinking hot chocolate, which was um, absolutely fine. So that's what she was referring to there. Um, terrorists um, are uh, the anaesthetist, who's the, the Dr. Cooper there. He always used to sort of say, and those physioterrorists, I mean therapists, um, just to sort of you know, get a bit of a laugh. So that's why it's referred to there. But I'm quoting him. So colleagues and uh, physio colleagues, um, no offence meant. Um, so then I decided that this is my dissertation. It's BSc level. So just remember that, colleagues, OK? Um, but I decided um, to do a quasi-experiment to find out, does patient education work? We've heard from the patients that they say um, that it is a good thing to do, um, but is it really going to sort of, you know, make a, a big difference in, in any sort of particular way? So I collected quite a lot of data. It was a convenience sample of 20 patients that had been on a pre-optive education programme with 21 patients who had not been on the programme. It wasn't that I'd stopped them deliberately. It was the, they, their surgery date had come forward before the education class or they'd chosen not to come onto the education programme. So I wasn't sort of doing any um, definite deprivation. So alongside the demographic data, I collected things like how much post-operative morphine they were using after surgery. There's a, a correlation between how much anxiety somebody has with how much pain they're going to experience. So I thought, well, if I can reduce their anxiety through pre-operative education, then hopefully they'd have less pain and therefore they'd want less morphine um, usage. It's very, it was a very simple experiment. And I was working with the anaesthetist on that. I also wanted to find out how soon they would be walking post-operatively independently with a walking frame and then independently with a walking stick. How soon they were going to be discharged post-operatively. Um, whether there are any post-operative dislocations, so you can dislocate your, your hip replacement. And at the time, it was thought to be through um, making a mistake in the, the doing the wrong movement. Um, I don't know that that's necessarily the case now, but that was the evidence base at the time. And I wasn't going to challenge the orthopaedics consultant to say it was anything to do with their surgery. Um, prop, the preparation at home as well, I did like a score list, a uh, checklist to sort of find out how much they were prepared at home um, ready for discharge, showing whether they were aware um, of what needed to be done. So these are the, the results. So the experimental group on the left, um, these are the patients that had been to the pre-optive education. Um, the control group are those that hadn't. So you can see here there was less morphine being used for the, the patients that had been at the, the pre-optive education programme, 30 um, as opposed to 38. Patients that had been at the education group were work, walking independently with a walking frame two days sooner. They were walking with a stick independently five days um, sooner. They were discharged four days quicker. This is average, mean average. Um, the preparation at home, they were much more prepared. They had done things like um, getting their chair raised. It might have been us that had gone out to do that. They'd called us out or we'd offered, or it might well have been family and friends had, had done things. So they'd got everything ready at home. Um, so that meant I'd got less home visits to do after surgery, but it means that I possibly would have done them preoptively. It's not necessarily a cost saving, um, but it might mean we could get them out quicker. And in fact, um, you know, we were able to get them, them home a lot quicker um, because they were discharged, I'd say, um, four days sooner. P complications postoperatively, only two complications for those that had had the preoperative education, where there were six um, for the control group, no dislocations in the experimental group, um, three in the control group. So I, for me, that was particularly sort of good. It was evidence. It was very simple research. It needed more to be done. But it was, yes, you're doing the right thing. Carry on. Um, particularly what I wanted to do was to go to the hospital management and say, well, what can I do with this? Can I continue to do preoptive education? So I did some sums, not my strong point. And um, I presented them to the hospital manager and said, look, just from 20 patients, I've saved you over £10,000. This is, you know, however many years ago. Um, can we sort of continue to do this? Can we have more funding to do these? Um, and he said yes. 
So I was able to sort of argue that preoperative education does support timely discharge. We can get home patients quicker. For me, that was great because then I can get the next one in on the waiting list um, in sooner if we can get patients out. Of course, that has cost implications, though, because the more hip replacements we're doing, the more expensive it is for the hospital. So there are problems with that. Um, but I was able to sort of speed up things. I was so wary of those patients, that Friday afternoon clinic that was struggling so much and wanted to get them in as soon as we could. So um, with no intention of leaving my job, I saw a job advertised at the university for an OT lecturer and thought, well, yeah, I'll go for that. Thank goodness I did that degree, the care and education degree at City College, because it meant that I had got a little bit of research um, knew a bit about education as well, um, and I got the job. I was offered it, and um, yeah, off I, I came. And it has been the most wonderful um, time here, a, a, a great opportunity. I became a lecturer and working with the students, and um, students are absolutely great. We are very blessed with the students that we have. They want a career in occupational therapy or physiotherapy and all the other professions now that, that we have working with us. Um, on the day that I uh, started, I had a lovely bouquet of flowers arrive from those girls that I'd lived with at, at college. And um, yeah, it was a, a good opportunity to, for me also to go back to, to carry on learning. Um, wasn't so chuffed about having to teach anatomy. It wasn't my strong point um, when I was at college. I don't think it was our strong point for any of us, was it? No. Um, but I had to learn anatomy so that I could teach it. The first year I was like a page ahead of the students and the next year I was two pages ahead. It's just another language, isn't it? You know, why is it so complicated? Um, but I even enjoyed doing that and, um, you know, if I can sort of break it down and make it easier, then I'm, I'm delighted to do it. But I, I, you know, give me a piece of paper and whether it's an hour session or a full three-year programme, um, I'd love to plan it and get on with it. That's, that's what I love doing. But I was very aware that um, as an occupational therapist, I kind of have this kite mark that I have this qualification, I've earned it, I've passed and therefore I'm allowed to be let loose with patients. As a teacher, as a lecturer, I hadn't got that, and you didn't have to have that when you first came here. That felt wrong. And so I decided to do my master's in the School of Education. And it, it was a, another opportunity to work um, outside of health. That was very good to enjoy, to sort of work with um, teachers again, but look at qualitative research. That's where I particularly love to find out about experiences that, that people had. But my first assignment, I felt, well, I, I don't know what I'm like as a teacher. I need to evaluate this and so um, I did some peer observation of my teaching I recorded my teaching and that was awful I wouldn't let anybody watch it nobody was allowed to watch um, a video recording that I'd done but I could look at it I could see things that I needed to improve about myself um, and they marked the assignment and they said yeah you know obviously pass this is, this is great but can we borrow this this is something that we want to do we want to introduce um, a master's program into the university for all people that come in that haven't got a teaching qualification um, and more recent staff that have joined us know now that you have to do a postgraduate certificate and you can go on to do a master's and it's based on that, that work that I did, a, a kind of a very reflective piece of work. So I had a number of different um, pieces of assignments to do and I looked at how to motivate students, how you can juggle competence. Remember, our students have to be competent healthcare professionals and, and kind of what that means really, but particularly learning by experience and reflection. And I did a number of studies working with our current students, but also graduates to look at how they learned um, post-registration as well. So it was a fantastic time. Um, but I managed to pass it and I've got my kite mark now that, uh, you know, master's in education, so um, I deserve to be here. So that was good for me, for my confidence. Um, went to a conference, you, you start to sort of um, publish your work, and um, it's a bit scary to start with, but you, you kind of get into that, and then somebody says, well, why don't you go to a conference and present your work? And that's like, oh my goodness, really? Um, so, yes, I can, I can do this. The first conference was a little bit, bit scary. Um, but when I was at this, this conference, I was listening to somebody present their work, and it was from, they'd done an educational doctorate, and I was with a colleague, and I said, gosh, that sounds wonderful. She said, well, you daft thing, they've got them at the University of East Anglia, why don't you do one? So I did. Um, <laughs> thanks to the UEA, you know, they're funding that. So this was um, part-time as well, so working full-time and um, doing the, an educational doctorate. It's a wonderful, wonderful course. To, um, with several of our co my colleagues have, have done this. So I decided to go back in my research to look at pre-optive education again. Um, felt that I really wanted to know more about it. What's the evidence base? Um, so the, hence the, the pictures around here, looking, exploring patient education. Um, 
There you go, Jane. It's my colleague Jane and I. So this is me having um, got my doctorate. So a number of assignments. The first one was looking at empowerment of clients through pre-optive education. It's about patients having control again. And I said it's a very disempowering situation when you walk into hospital. So I wanted to find out um, from a number of, by then there's quite a few of these courses going on around the country. And I um, spoke to a number of occupational therapists that were running these clinics. And it was the discourse that they were using that led me to sort of think about, yes, that what we're doing is trying to give patients control. We're enabling them to feel empowered again. So sometimes it's just in the discourse that they're using, the, the, the language, it's demystifying, it's breaking down those barriers. Um, choices through informed decision making. It's about involving them. Um, it, it's quite a shock really when, when patients, they do kind of hand over everything. It's not always an informed choice, but if we can at least educate them, then it's, the choices are more informed. Um, it's meeting others in the same situation and again, it's feeling valued. So that was really important for me that, um, you know, we'd, we'd got this, this massive potential, if you like, through pre-optive education. Um, a couple more of uh, pieces of research that I did, looking at patients' views this time. So the quotes there were from patients, things that they said, we were told everything, everything I wanted to know was explained. I have faith in the service, all fears expelled and I'm not worried now. That's particularly important, isn't it? We want to reduce anxiety. It helped to know what to expect. I think I knew everything I wanted to know about the operation because it was in the booklet and then from the teaching. So um, a good thing, it's, it's working. So you're, you're kind of looking at well, what this means. It means that you are giving patients um, control, some control back and you're reducing their anxiety um, and that, that's huge. Um, then I started my thesis, so this was in the final two years, and now I wanted to, I, I can't think, I'd got all of the evidence to show that pre-optive education works, it's a good thing to do, but I didn't really know how it worked, um, and how, how can this thing, what is it about it that, that's kind of working? Um, again, in the right place at the right time, because I wanted to do a case study. I wanted to understand pre-optive education. So a case study in research is where you're getting lots of different data and putting it together to create a, a new jigsaw um, puzzle. But action research was what I wanted to do as well, because action research is about involving people and making improvements. And that, for me, was key. I want to make a difference out there um, in the health service. Well, lucky me for being here at the UEA, because Stenhouse, um, who was an educationist here at the UEA, had put the two together, action research case study. Um, and so I thought, well, this is, this is just perfect. This is what I, I need to go and explore. So this is an action research um, circle. And this is how I used the research. So the acting was the pre-optive education programs that were being running in a trust. So I'd approached a trust and said, could I work with you? Um, I want to sort of collect data. Um, the purpose is about improving it, but I want to involve you and your team. And I'm not going to be telling you what to do. We're going to work together on this. So they were providing the pre-optive education and I would collect data in a number of ways. Having collected, collected the data, I would then take it back to the team and said, well, look, this is what the patients have said in various different ways, evaluation questionnaires or in interviews that are done with them. What do you want to do with it? What's it telling you? Um, so they kind of did some reflections and then they said, well, we need to change this. We need to add this, take this out. Um, so they planned some changes and then you start the cycle again. You reevaluate, you collect more data to find out whether you've actually have made an improvement or not. So that's a, a typical circle. And I did, in this piece of research, I did um, two of these action research cycles. So data that I collected, I attended their planning meetings with the team. I observed five of the education sessions, the classes, um, 26 patient questionnaires, 20 interviews with the 10 patients and three carers. So I entered them pre-operatively and then post-operatively. Because it's important, they, they don't pay, you know, none of us know what we don't know. So after the operation, what would you like to know and that perhaps you didn't? Um, interviews with the, the clinical staff and I looked at the documentation that were, was given. So um, not a huge um, piece of research, but it, it took a, a year to do all of this. So as a result of the action research, presenters, they, they made 21 changes to the programme, um, particularly around organisation and delivery. The content didn't need to change that much, um, but it was around how it was organised and, and delivered. And that really was about sort of the way the education programme was delivered, the process, the educational interaction. Um, and we felt that it really um, made a difference in terms of um, helping the patients to kind of um, understand what was happening to them more, but involve them a little bit more. 
So things that we did, we made the invitation letter more informative. Um, we prepared the venue a lot better. It was a bit of a, a sort of a, well, a bit difficult really. We were on a day, a, a day ward and um, all the chairs and beds had been pushed out of the way. It looked like a, a junk shop. Um, so we made it look more presentable. There was more consistency between the presenters. We brought them together in a way they hadn't done before. They kind of entered in, did their little bit and walked out again. And this time they kind of had a better understanding of what each other was saying. So they, they, um, had, they had more confidence um, in what they were presenting. We had a question box at the end as well for patients that don't ask the embarrassing question perhaps. Um, and all the presenters stayed behind to answer questions at the end. So this was my thesis, if you like, um, from the study. It's how preoperative education works. It's about the product, the knowledge, um, gives patients understanding, but it's the way that it's done, the process. is about engaging patients and it building up a partnership. And through that, I said, that's how you build up patients' confidence and that's how they can get some control back. If they haven't got that, then I don't think they're going to be easily be able to take some control in that situation. Um, I was approached by some colleagues to say, um, would you work with um, us, your, your kind of experience in patient information for people with vasculitis. So we um, got together, there was um, Janice Mooney, Richard Watts, Fiona Poland, and we um, applied for some money from the Arthritis and Rheumatism Council, as was then, and we got £48,000 to, to do a study. Um, and again, it was focus groups and working with patients that have got vasculitis, and we wanted to explore what their needs were. So it's very different. It wasn't pre-operative this time. And they were telling us, well, you know, you have this diagnosis of a very rare, potentially life-threatening disease, but you're, you're given lots of information at the time um, of diagnosis, um, but it's too much to take in because you've got to um, engage with this very difficult um, and quite harrowing treatment process. Um, you feel that your life is at risk, and for some, you know, that is the case. So we put together an information booklet um, that um, hadn't been sort of around before, and we did some work online as well, and um, lots of publications from that. So it's really nice to kind of build on the work that I'd done, but go into a, a slightly different area. And then, another piece of research, another piece of fate here. I was um, supervising a master's student, um, Gabby Thorpe, um, uh, who was working in the colorectal service um, at a nearby hospital. And she said, well, you're working preoperative education. Why don't you get in touch with um, the surgeon there? He's doing preoperative education, and he really wants to sort of look at developing that further. So I did just that and said, you know, can we work together? Um, so several of us put together, a, um, again, an application through the Research for Patient Benefit Program, part of the National Institute for Health Research, and we got nearly a quarter of a million pounds. So we employed um, Sheila. So you've got um, Kevin um, Sargent, the, um, the colorectal surgeon, Fiona, the sociology researcher, Jane McCulloch, specialist care, um, stoma nurse, myself. Penny we employed as a researcher to help us, and Penny Rickery, um, service user. Um, representative and one of the reasons we got the money um, was because we involved Penny right from the beginning she helped with planning the research um, and that was key and that was quite unique then um, and it's paved the way for lots more research where we involve people so data collection um, went back to doing the action research case study it worked I wanted to do it again um, and the people at the trust were very happy for me to do that so we collected a lot more data we had 97 patients 19 carers and 22 clinical staff um, and Penny was observing all the clinic interactions that were happening pre-optively and um, we got patients to fill in questionnaires for us um, we asked them got them um, individual staff interviews Individual patient and care interviews, we interviewed them um, before surgery, immediately after, and then 12 weeks. Again, we could get a bit more of a longitudinal picture. We looked at their patient records, and we had focus groups and, and patient documentation. So very similar um, piece of study. Um, and what we were doing, we were, again, using, because it was action research, we were involving the whole team. We were gathering the data, but again, we were going back to the team and saying, what does this say? What do you want to do with it? We're not going to tell you what to do um, with the data you choose. Um, and so we kind of had a, a quite a, a big remit here. So the three academic researchers, very different background, um, sociologists, me as an OT in education, and then... Um, narrative research was Penny's area, uh, Sheila's area, sorry. 
and the, the public and uh, patient and public involvement we had um, great links through Penny was to go out sort of wider and we did conferences and things together as, as a result of that but also the colorectal team had their whole team that they could go out and we made lots of different changes to the program we felt we'd um, made significant changes and here's just some of them so food and diet advice oh my goodness wasn't it a struggle Poor patients, so, you know, that you, you are bombarded in the media with what's the right thing to eat and, and what's not. But when you're going to have this type of surgery, you cannot have a high-fibre diet. And that goes against everything they've read. So it takes a while um, to take that in. Um, but could we get the catering department to change the ward menus? Oh, no. So the poor patients would get this menu and it would say jacket potato and baked beans. Well, <laughs> no, you can't have jacket potato and baked beans. Um, so it took us a while, three cycles, to try and get that one sorted out. Um, things like giving good and bad news in private, the curtains just around a bed is not going to work. So, um, yeah, take somebody to a private room to, to give news. One patient said to the, our researcher, I kept wondering who this Dr Stoma was. I'd got no idea I was expecting this doctor to come along. So it hadn't been made clear to them what a stoma was. So when it was first mentioned, actually get one out. It seems obvious now, but get one out, show the patient... Um, what a stoma is and um, what's going to be happening to them. So lots of different things there, as you can see, um, that we made. A particular um, good thing was a, um, an information for patients accepting a cancellation. So they'd not had the chance to all this pre-optive education. So at least give them something to do some reading. Um, and we did some training with the ward staff as well. So particularly at weekends and evenings, um, they hadn't got specialist um, training in, in stoma care. So lots of things that we felt we judged to be um, a good thing that had made improvements, and that was what we really wanted. So our conclusions. Well, we already knew that colorectal surgery confronts patients with sudden bodily changes and health uncertainties. Most of these patients, it was um, for cancer um, of the colon. Um, we know that information can enhance recovery and we know that pre-optive education can provide information for patients to help them get some control back. Um, but what we felt this study added was that involving the patients themselves and the carers through action research really offer, offered um, a practice-embedded way of developing practice. It, did in, it, involve, it meant changes were being made. Patients wanted to enhance their recovery. Um, that was sort of, you know, particularly important to them. They were hungry for information and how could they use it. And the way that the education is delivered, um, but again, really important. It's not so much what you say, of course that's important, it's how you're doing it and do it in lots of different ways. There was a DVD um, that patients can, can watch, um, they've given information, they've um, discussed information with them, so lots of different ways of getting that information. And, and again, that was reinforcing what my previous research had said, it's the way that you do it um, through engagement. And so I um, sort of modified slightly the, um, the plan that I put together really from my last piece of work. And again, the product, what we do and how we do it um, is instrumental. The product gives knowledge um, and we called it situated understanding. Patients very much wanted to know what it meant for them. So we can share all of this information, but everyone, we're, we're the same. You know, if we get information, what does it mean to me? And you can do that, again, through how you go about it, engaging the patient. That builds up patient's confidence. It means that you can work in partnership. Um, and it's proactive involvement. And really, for us, that was about enhanced recovery, supporting the patients to um, get better quicker. So confidence, I'm nearly there, folks. Confidence has sort of um, been through this um, for, for me with patients. How do you support patients to develop their confidence? Um, but it's also been part of that for my career. So how to support patients to gain confidence, how to support students to gain confidence, because that's one of the things that we're, we're needing to do and the things that I learned about when I was doing my master's. And also confidence in myself as an OT and an academic. That's been part of my, my journey. So confidence has been key. Um, as you heard earlier, that I have had a number of leadership roles within the, the university, and it's been um, great. So 21 years last week I've been here, um, and it's given me lots of opportunities. So opportunities to study and learn and hopefully make a difference out there, um, but also to learn about 
um, putting curriculum together, um, how you encourage students to come to the university, how we think about enhancing um, our cu the curriculum that we have here. So admissions officer, course director for OT, and then course director for um, the master's programme after the, the BSc programme. I think those are my favourites. Jane and I made a fantastic team, um, even if I say so myself, um, in terms of managing the, the curriculum. It's, the school was in its infancy then, it was just OT and physio. Um, and then Martin and I as course director he for the physiotherapy team. Um, and the associate dean, that was a great opportunity to kind of stick my nose in and meddle in, be outside of the school a little bit and have an influence. Um, and then the deputy head of school. So I've had lots of fantastic opportunities here and the UEA has made that all happen. So I've had the opportunity to collaborate on teaching initiatives and uh, I, sorry Suzanne, I see you're not happy about that, and research <laughs> projects. <laughs> that was the only one I could find <laughs> with some great colleagues and friends, so thank you very much. I'm also grateful to people who asked me to take on some of these leadership roles. I didn't actually ever put myself forward for any of them. So Moya Wilson and Jenny Routledge, Jenny's here today, that's great, thank you. Richard Stevenson, Jill Robinson, Jacqueline Collier and Val Latimer. So I didn't always have my confidence to put myself forward, but they encouraged me to do a number of jobs. I was even actually asked twice before I said yes. Um, um, so um, it's a great team that I've worked with. I particularly want to thank Dawn as well for her support um, as my PA. Um, we've been a great team. So I've been able to do my own sort of thing to a certain extent. I hope it has supported the university um, in its sort of strategic plans, but I've also been able to do mine and I've been able to develop along the way. Are you ready? <laughs> Fab at 50. So these are the three girls that I lived with at college. And um, <laughs> we went, we've been saving up for a couple of years. We put a little bit of money away each week and we head off somewhere nice. Um, for I shouldn't have put 50, she said 40. Never mind. Um, <laughs> and particular thanks for coming because Sue's come from Bowie St Edmunds, Helen from Northampton, and Elsa all the way from the Wirral. It's picked up on the train station. Thank goodness British Rail, there wasn't snow on the line tonight. Okay. Special thank you then. To my parents, thank you. <laughs> Supported me in everything, so um, really appreciate him. Then, this little chap, halfway through my doctorate, um, Mark and I, the guy that was at the guitar lessons, um, did push me on the bus. Um, what did his Duke of Edinburgh on that school trip, went back for that honeymoon. And um, we decided that we were going to have a family and we were going to have um, this little chap. So halfway through, and um, Ollie saved me. Sometimes when you're kind of doing your research and, you know, there's the Dens and Lincoln, no disrespect, but I actually preferred Kipper the dog, so I could read to Ollie um, Kipper the dog instead of my research textbook, so I would creep off and uh, do that when I could, so he was the most precious distraction. Embarrass you just a little bit, Ollie. <laughs> and then, so this is the, the family who've supported me um, enormously, my in-laws as well, who are also here. Um, thank you to them too. That's it. And my final message is to make the most of all of those unplanned and unexpected events and all the potential great marriages. You never know where they might lead and the fortuitous happy circumstances that, that come from it. Um, they've enabled me to be in such a great place. Um, OT and education have been a great marriage for me particularly. So thank you all for listening. So thank you, thank you, Nicola, for a wonderful, entertaining, engaging <laughs> lecture. Uh, I'm Dylan Edwards. I'm the brand new, two-day-old executive dean of the Faculty of Medicine and Health. This isn't my first official duty, but this is the nicest so far since I've been in the job. I'll take that, two days in. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's been a, a great story that, that you've really shown the warmth and the compassion of the things that you, you, you study. And it's great to see it in, in the warmth and the support of the, the friends and the family and the colleagues that you have here. Uh, and really, I, I, I think it highlights the, the, the passion that, that you have for your subject and how important it is to society. This is in a time when we're aging as a population, when the... the uh, the, the care costs in the health service is so important that we understand how best to make how to make things better for patients and for the care systems that look after them. So, will you join me in thanking Nicola for a wonderful talk? Thank you.